And on top of all this, women are twice as likely as men, or almost twice as likely as men, to develop Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia on the planet, which means that for every man with Alzheimer's disease, there are two women. And no one talks about it. But the bottom line is that a woman in her 60s is almost twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease in her life than she is to develop breast cancer. Women who are physically active after the age of 35 have a 30% lower risk of dementia in old age than women who are sedentary. Welcome to the show, Lisa Moscone, neuroscientist and author of The XX Brain. Welcome to Women of Impact. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here and to see you in person. Almost. I'm so excited. And where I want to start, I want to just jump right into something that you call bikini medicine. And I have a quote of yours um, that describes b- Mickey, uh, bikini medicine. Um, And it's assuming that women are essentially men with breasts and tubes, yet women are far more more likely than men to suffer from anxiety, depression, migraines, brain injuries, and strokes. They are also twice as likely to end their lives suffering from Alzheimer's disease, even when their longer lifespans are taken into account. Talk to me about bikini medicine. Yes, bikini medicine has been a big issue for me as a scientist. And bikini medicine is is saying that from a medical perspective, what makes a woman a woman is literally just those parts of the body that we can fit under a bikini or that are covered by a bikini. So her breasts, her tubes, her ovaries. And that has meant that historically, medical professionals would diagnose and treat both genders the same exact way thinking that if i'm testing a medicine for the brain i can just test it in a bunch of men and whatever i find is going to apply to women as well and the same for the heart right if i have a heart medication that works for men it is just assumed that it would work the same for women and that is completely not the case it's just not the truth and we know that I mean, if you, if you take a bunch of basic scientists or biologists, they will tell you metabolism is different. Women absorb nutrients and drugs very differently than men do. And the same drug may have completely different effects in men and women. And then you just go to discover the science, which is what I do for the most part. And there's a complete disregard for women's brains as a whole. For a very long time, women were not even included in research. And now that we do include them, we never look at women as being different from men, which is lump men and women together. And then actually we've removed the effects of sex using statistical manipulations, which is really saying once again, even now in 2021, is really saying that women are broadly indistinguishable from men, except there's some ovaries in there. That's so powerful. And that's where really where I wanted to start because really shining the light of how important this is and everything like I've known up until this day, um, like your book really made me rethink things. And I think that's so incredible for us to just give the awareness to people first. And that's really where I wanted to, why I wanted to start there because I think it begins with awareness. And then like you get so tactical in your book about what you can do and how you can eat and how you can optimize your brain as a female, which we're definitely going to get into. But just to really give people the actual like hard truth about what you're saying about how medicine up until this point hasn't treated men and women differently. Um, can you talk us through the ambient and what happened there? Because I think that really highlights how a study can lead us women astray yes so ambien is the most popular sleep medication at least in the united states but i think there are similar formulations all over the world and the drug was mostly developed um, in clinical trials that included mostly men even the preclinical studies because usually drugs are tested in animals first in animals first usually it's mice or rodents in the vast majority of preclinical studies 
are really focused on male animals. Female animals are not included because scientists would say that hormonal fluctuations make them too variable to study. And so they just look at the male animals and then assume that the drug that works for a male mouse will work for an actual woman, which is not the case. But long story short, women used to be given very high doses of Ambien because the doses were based on men, on men's body's ability to metabolize the drug and obtain a certain amount of efficacy, right? And then what happened, which is really bizarre, is that insurance companies started asking, what is going on with women? Why are all these women getting into car crashes? And the answer was Ambien. There were women who were taking men derived doses of, of sleep medications and would literally overdose and sleepwalk throughout the day and then get into car accidents, not because they can't drive, but because they were effectively over medicated. And so a number of scientists really knocked on the door of the FDA and said, we have to cut down the dose, which was eventually cut in half. And now it is safe to take, but just think about all the million women who were injured or or literally got in trouble for simply following guidelines that completely disregarded the woman's physiology, right? And the knowledge that their bodies just don't work the same way. Yeah, that's it. When I heard you tell that story, that is so powerful because it just gives people a perspective of how what we've been taught up to this point. Um, and now how do we shift that thinking and shift um, the, the studies that we're doing and the way that we approach it as women. And so if you can take me deeper now on the, the, the XX brain, as we like to refer to as the female brain, the XX brain, um, and why it's very important to understand the XX brain that is different to the XY brain. Mm. I think it is really important to, to realize that their brains are just not the same. And, and the most important factor in my opinion is that women's brains don't age the same way the men's brains age. And when I say age, I'm not thinking 80s or 90s. I mean, from, from the beginning of your life, from the moment you're born, actually even before a baby is born, our brains are wired a little bit differently to respond to stimulation differently, whether the stimulation be hormones or enzymes or stress or just life. And the reason that this is important is that men's brains and women's brains are not different in the sense that one is better than the other. I, I really want to be clear about that. We're not supporting gender stereotypes. I'm not saying that, you know, pink and blue is a thing that girls should play with dolls and boys should be given trains. That's not the point. Mm. The point is that the way that the brain is built or the way that the brain functions really dictates different strengths and different vulnerabilities. And that is very important. We all know that women have a better verbal memory than men, for example. There are people who debate that, there are people who don't believe it, but on average across studies, women have an edge when it comes to remembering verbal information. That's a strength that is hardly ever celebrated, right? But at the same time, there, there's also risks that impact women's brains more. And we never talk about this, but for context, you mentioned those risks before, but I really want to clarify the magnitude of the problem, yeah. right? So women are twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or depression. There are millions of people with anxiety or depression. We're three times more likely to develop an autoimmune condition, including those that attack the brain, like multiple sclerosis. We're four times more likely to suffer from migraines and headaches, as any woman knows. And we're also more likely to die of a stroke or to develop certain forms of brain tumors already in our 30s and 40s. And on top of all this, women are twice as likely as men, or almost twice as likely as men, to develop Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia on the planet, which means that for every man with Alzheimer's disease, there are two women. 
and no one talks about it, right? When you talk about women's health or women's health issues, we're all thinking about breast cancer. That's mm-hmm. the first thing that comes to mind, right? It has the pink ribbon, as it should. Yeah. But the bottom line is that a woman in her 60s is almost twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease in her life than she is to develop breast cancer. That is so insane. Right. It's frightening and it's scary. And we don't talk about it, right? Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think if it's that dramatic that it hasn't become the norm discussion? Because it has not been started that way. So I have a family history of Alzheimer's disease that really affects the women in my family. And Mm -hmm. I always wanted to study the brain. So as soon as I was able to, I started asking questions. Like, is it just my family? Is it everybody? And back then, people would say to me, well, you know, after aging itself, being a woman is the most significant risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. However, it doesn't really matter because women live longer than men and Alzheimer's is a disease of old age. So it's really just the women live longer. And, huh, okay. But then you look at the numbers and women don't live that much longer than men. <laughs> like in the United States, the difference is four years, not 20. In England, the difference is two and a half years. And Alzheimer's disease or dementia is the number one cause of death only for women and not for men. So there's something more, clearly, yeah. right? And we started looking into that years ago. And long story short, we show that number one, not just us, but scientists show that Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of old age, but starts in midlife with negative changes to the brain that then eventually lead to the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, the memory loss, the confusion, all those kind of issues. And midlife is any age from 35 to 65. <laughs> and so, so it's not midlife and some fuzzy 60 year old thing is like 35 40 years old you're middle aged just for kind of just frightening yeah yeah <laughs> but then that changed the question my question then was okay if alzheimer's disease starts in midlife what is it that happens only to women and not to men in midlife that could potentially trigger alzheimer's disease in a woman's brain yeah And we show that the answer is menopause and losing your hormones, which really was very, very unexpected and changed the way that we work and that we think about prevention. So I think it's really about women's brains, not just Alzheimer's or menopause or this or that. It's more about getting a sense of the full picture. Ladies, 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 I know sometimes you worry that you're not good enough. Trust me, nobody knows that better than me. I spent almost a freaking decade having my soul sucked out of my body, doing something that I didn't love. Finally, even though I was scared to freaking death, I decided I was going to go for it. And I've ended up building the life of my dreams, a life I couldn't have imagined because I realized that radical confidence is being afraid and doing it anyway. I wrote this book for you with 10 no BS lessons that you need to go from feeling stuck and frustrated to doing anything that you set your mind to. Yeah, and look to me, I'm always, how do I get the full picture, the accurate information so that I can then adjust accordingly, right? It's it's like, what life do I want? And then how do I act in my current life in order to set me up for future successes? And so when I think about how cognitive aware I want to be for my entire life and then what are the things that I'm doing now in not just showing up now to have clarity of mind and you know to have a good memory but also for the long term you talk about the three p's so you've got puberty pregnancy and then premenopausal perimenopause perimenopause um so can you actually take us through so let's say you're going through puberty what is happening to the brain there and so that we can kind of break it down and then, yeah, then we'll talk about the pregnancy part. Yes. So during puberty, puberty is like an explosion 
of hormonal power. Because this is really when your ovaries basically turn on and they start producing hormones that give you a menstrual cycle and also allow you to get pregnant. And that's been happening earlier and earlier on in life. At this point, some, some girls uh, go through puberty when they're 11, the average age is 12. And that is a huge change, not just for the body, but also inside the brain. And you would think that all these hormones would have a sort of boosting effect on the brain, right? But when you actually do brain scans and you look at the brain of adolescents, the brain is shrinking. As you get older. As you get older, your brain is shrinking, even though your body is growing at that stage. And a lot of connections between neurons are discarded with a process that is called pruning. Because what happens when you're born is that your brain just shoots out neurons the whole time. And all these neurons form connections with other neurons that are called synapses. But many of these connections at some point are no longer useful because your brain can go on autopilot, right? By the time you're 12, you know how to ride a bike, mm -hmm. you know how to tie your shoes, you know how to make your own lunch. So all those connections can go and make room for new connections. So they're mostly related to social cognition and really becoming a, a member of society. So you need to grow brain regions. So some brain regions shrink because they're no longer needed. Those neurons are, are not needed anymore. But other brain regions actually grow, like the memory center of the brain grows. The emotional center of the brain is called the amygdala. That also grows. The frontal cortex, which is in charge of judgment, planning, and reasoning, and controlling instincts and impulses, also grows a lot during adolescence. Does that grow in a different way to then the XY brain, the male brain? Yes. So these connections are stronger in girls, in teenage girls. They develop earlier on in life relative to boys' brains. And that has been interpreted as girls reaching maturity, intellectual mm. maturity, a little bit earlier on than men, but also mostly about being more on top of things and like being better at judging the situation and also being able to manage risks a little bit more effectively. And at that point, your verbal abilities are also better as a girl, mm. language is more developed and a few other things. And again, these differences are subtle and there's no need to overemphasize them, but it is interesting to see that the trajectory of development it is a, are a little bit different between both so Does that have then a knock-on effect depending on them when you get as a female, when you get your period? So like if you got your period ah. later, would your brain develop l later? Partially. So what happens with the menstrual cycle is that as the hormones change and fluctuate throughout the month, so does your brain and so do your brain connections. So when estrogen levels are highest, which is right before ovulation, that's literally when you can see, which is incredible, you can see the synapses firing up and dendrites growing. Dendrites, so neurons look like trees a little bit and the branches are called dendrites. You can see these branches literally growing and expanding right before ovulation. And then withdraw when your estrogen goes down before menstruation. So even throughout the menstrual cycle, the brain changes on a weekly, if not daily basis. And granted, these are not huge changes, but they are significant enough for some women to feel the change, right? So many women are intuitively aware mm -hmm. that their mood changes throughout the menstrual cycle, that their focus is different, their energy is different. And that's in part hormonal and in part is literally that your brain is changing along with your reproductive organs. And it's wonderful. And that is pretty much stable throughout a woman's reproductive life until you get pregnant. I think what, what we're missing in general is the fact that people are organisms. Mm. Because Western medicine is always about 
specialties. You either understand the brain or you understand. Right. Yes. Right. You it, like I am a brain person and I never thought I would be talking about hormones or ovaries. And if I talk to my OBGYN colleagues, which I do daily at this point, they don't really know what to do with their brains. You know, they don't manage brain health. They don't manage brain. They don't know how to read the brain scan. But in reality, this is a, this is a system that, that works as a system and changes at the same time. And whatever happens to your ovaries has an impact in your brain. Lisa, this is why this discussion is so important and your book is so amazing. Um, so I've had a lot of health issues in my gut and I've been battling them for now probably over, over six years. And when it first started happening, I had gut issues, I couldn't eat, I hadn't had a period, um, I was always tired, always brain fog. And every time I would go to a doctor, if I went to, you know, the, the gut specialist, oh, I've got a tablet for that. But then over here, if I'd go to my, you know, gynecologist, it was something else. And I'm like, guys, there seems like there's a connection here, you know, and it's just like, but no one is like, they're like, oh, no one was talking to each other. And so I think it is so freaking important what you're saying, because I'm all about empowerment. How do I empower myself with knowledge so that I can approach any situation that I'm looking looking for with the knowledge and then I can adjust, right? So if it's, I want to feel extremely confident today, I know that my hormones have to do with it. And I know that by looking at the cycle or where I am in my cycle, I can determine whether this is a good time for me to step up and be confident, or actually it's a time to self-soothe and relax and take it more easy. And we don't talk enough about that because I know I've even heard you say, it's like a freaking superpower. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a superpower. I think if we were just educated and, and we had the information and the knowledge, we could really use it to our advantage. Because it's important, even just, just exactly what you were saying, what you said, like, no, how much coffee are you going to drink today? Does mm -hmm. it matter? Did, did you notice that there's, if you drink the same amount of coffee before ovulation and after ovulation, the effect is going to be completely different? Do you mind if we dive deep in that? Because that's the sort of the stuff. So thank you for bringing that up. So you've spoken about, um, so it, when it comes to optimization, there's diet, there's supplements, exercise, stress, and sleep. So I'd love to go deep on into those. Um, and then we definitely will talk about the pregnancy because that is so important that I definitely want to make sure that we touch there. Um, but you, so let's talk about diet for, for starters. I, I love talking about diet in part because it's a very powerful tool that we have because everybody eats every day, right? So we're all, as a society, we're, we're comfortable with the idea that we feed our bodies and that our diet will reflect into what kind of clothing we will, you, we will wear mm. or, you know, a certain body weight or body type. But the truth is that the same exact foods that change your body also really impact the functionality of the brain. So the way that we respond, that the body responds to stimulants changes throughout the cycle. Okay. In that when your estradiol levels are high, which is the week before ovulation and the few days afterwards, then the stimulants would really have a good positive effect. So if your estrogen is high, you have a lot of energy, you don't need as much coffee and you feel the effects more strongly. Okay. But in the second part of the cycle, you'll need three times more coffee to achieve the same level of alertness. Whoa! Oh, no, I mean, times? three times is, is, is ballpark. I just mean... Still, before. though, I mean, that's... A, yeah, <laughs> look, it's still a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's still a lot. I mean, you'll need, you need more. You'll need more caffeine to have the same kind of response. And yeah. that's why many women will drink too much coffee and then you get the jitters so you don't feel so good mm -hmm. that you actually feel tired because you have exceeded your threshold. So I think this is important to, to keep in mind. And something I like to do personally during the second half of the cycle is that I switch to cacao tea. I love coffee. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and, yeah, from Italian. So my is <laughs> important to me. But sometimes if I feel like tired and there's no reason for me to be tired, then I'll be like, oh, maybe, you know, it's a specific kind of moment 
of the month. And maybe I want to switch to something more gentle. Actually, just recently, I was like, why do I want the cacao so much? And I think in part mm. is, the, is the fact that it gives you more energy for longer periods of time, especially if you mix it. Mm. So caffeine and theobromine, which is the antioxidant that's found in cacao powder, they're both vasodilating nutrients Mm. so they improve blood flow to the brain the difference is that the action the half-life of caffeine is shorter so the effect goes away a little bit faster and also it impacts heart rate whereas the theobromine in raw cacao has a gentler effect it is more sustained over time a little bit like tea if you drink Mm. black tea you don't get the rush of energy but you'll be up at night (laughs) if you drink it yeah yeah so kind of like that and also if you mix it with something that contains a little bit of fat like either milk if you drink milk or oat milk or you know whatever you like that contains a bit of fat that will slow down the release of the caffeine or the theobromine to the brain giving you more energy over time yeah which is one of the reasons that the bulletproof coffee works so well so for women, we need to be a little bit more careful or just a little bit more aware, especially those who, who do have sensitivity to stimulants. The same goes for alcohol. Mm, mm. That's fascinating. Um, are there any foods? So you mentioned like antioxidants. So is it a better time to eat like more blueberries in your cycle? I actually, I was, well, yeah, I think you want to eat even more antioxidants and iron compound you know foods can contain iron and minerals is towards the end of your cycle as you prepare for menstruation oh yeah but you know it's very depleting to to have a menstrual cycle so it's really important i think to replenish all the nutrients and and be sure to support your body because there's also an inflammatory component right and so the antioxidants that double down as anti-inflammatory Nutrients are very helpful in that respect. See, there's so much more to food than just food. Food is information Mm -hmm. and food is function. And and one of the functionalities of food is that very specific nutrients can literally speak to our cells. So, for example, omega-3 fatty acids. And everybody's aware that omega-3 fatty acids are good for you. They're good for your body. They're good for your brain. They're good for your heart. And mostly have anti-inflammatory capacities and one way that they do so is that they literally speak to your dna in your cells and tell them and they would be like okay i'm here you don't have to produce that many anti-inflammatory compounds Mm. because i'm in the circulation whereas if it's not present then your dna will know that it needs to make more anti-inflammatory enzymes to to balance it out so there's always the relationship between the foods that we eat and the way that their body needs to respond and either upgrade the production of certain things or downregulate it. I find it fascinating. And it's the same in the brain. Yeah, I find that fascinating too. And there's just something different though about the body. It speaks to you, you know, like, oh, my, my shoulder aches, right? And you're like, what did I do? And you like think about what you did. And, you know, it's so very specific in the moment but like the brain even just like reading your book and understanding what we're doing now has like 30 year effect you know effects on you 30 years later like that really becomes um very enlightening and to make sure that i'm trying to eat the right things right now so you've said about the diet during the cycle you mentioned omega-3 um would you suggest an omega-6 is that right or just three yeah so usually we recommend a balance between omega-3 okay. and omega-6. Um, the point is that the Western diet, the typical Western diet contains a ton of omega-6 fatty acids and very mm-hmm. little of the omega-3s. So I think it's helpful to focus on foods that contain more omega-3s and trying to eat less of those that are very high in omega-6 compounds. Mm-hmm. You want a two-to-one ratio, whereas the typical Western diet is a 20 to one ratio in favor of the omega-6 or even higher than that because of all the oils and all the refined oils and Mm. all the peanuts and meat and whatnot so fish is a good source of omega-3 fatty acids fish Mm -hmm. shellfish um you don't have to necessarily eat fish a lot of people don't like it some people don't want to eat it 
because of environmental concerns and whatnot. So there are plant-based sources of omega-3s that are really great. I had switched from my beloved extra virgin olive oil to flax oil. So one tablespoon of flax oil contains almost all the omega-3s you need for the form of ALA. So you actually should have a little bit more for your brain because ALAs are the plant-based omega-3s, but they need to be converted into DHA and EPA. And about 70% of the fat is lost in the conversion. So you actually have to eat more. So then you go for hemp seeds or um, flax seeds or chickpeas or legumes or something like that. Some nuts and seeds. And then back to the olive oil for dinner. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'll do a bit of a blend. <laughs> um, so, okay, so that's fascinating. And so if you're unable to get it from natural foods, um, I assume supplements is the next best thing? Yes, I would say so. Uh, if you're concerned that your diet might be too low in these nutrients, then supplements are definitely recommended. What I would say is then supplements should not replace a healthy diet. Mm. And I find that sometimes people would much rather get the supplements than eat healthily. And that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So it's best to really focus on having a healthy diet and a diverse diet with all sorts of foods and nutrients and supplements as a backup. I would say that would be my backup plan. Lots of patients would come to us and say, give me something. You know, whether it's supplement or something, and so we're like, well, let, let's do some tests first and see if your levels are actually low, because otherwise supplements don't work. They only work if they're supplementing, which means that you have to be low in the nutrients first in order for the supplement to have a benefit for you. So I think it's important to know yourself, know your numbers. I think in medicine, we're switching to a precision medicine approach where instead of treating the average person or to treat a person as a point in a regression line, you know, we actually want to understand the person in front of us and, and do all the tests that we can do and understand your physiology and then interact with your physiology in a way that it is helpful to you. I think that's so important. (laughs) Yeah, because that's the thing, especially so I've been married to my husband now for almost 20 years. And, you know, when he's when he's taking no vitamin D and he's taking all these supplements and, it, you know, originally I was just copying whatever he was doing. So everything that you're talking about is being very um, catered to you, I think is so spot on. Um, So I love that. Um, but now let's talk about exercise because I heard you say, and it's so true where you have, let's say like the woman wants to like lose weight. Right. And so she's like changes her diet and she goes on like these sprints and does all these exercises and like loses half a pound. And then you've got the guy that just quits soda and doesn't change his exercise routine at all. And then ends up losing 20 pounds. So that obviously can be very frustrating, but I think it's actually important to discuss what is happening to a female, um, what exercises can we do that is good for our brains. Um, so yeah, if you can take us down now, that would be great. Mm-hmm. I think that is really important. Exercise is the same as diet. There is no one size that fits all and it's very personal. And it depends. It depends on what your goals are. If we're thinking about the brain, yeah. Then what's really important is not intensity as much as consistency. This is what the research on exercise and brain health shows. Then the key is really, obviously, if you if you can go higher intensity and it's enjoyable to you and you can do it, good. Absolutely. Nobody's going to stop you, believe me. But the problem, especially in the United States, is that people don't exercise that much to start with. And especially for women, there's a very sharp decline in the amount of time that is devoted to exercise or even just moving, just being physically active as soon as we're past college, right? Because of whatever reasons in societies and demands and growing a family and just holding a job and whatnot, women just don't make as much time for exercise as they do for other things. What is important is to make exercise a routine part of your wellness plan. 
right? So to speak. And it's very hard to do that. It's honestly very hard. But what the brain wants at the minimum, it's a moderate intensity exercise. And the need for frequency ranges between three and five times a week. And most experts recommend at least 45 minutes a moderate intensity exercise three to five times a week. If you can do five, it's better than three. If you can do three, it's better than none. Yeah. So I think it's also important to be gentle with yourself and really understand whether or not a specific routine fits into your everyday life and make it sustainable. Women who are physically active after the age of 35 have a 30% lower risk of dementia in old age than women who are sedentary. And 30% is insane. 30%, one in three. One in three. So that is very important. If we had drugs that lowered your risk of dementia in old age by 30%, it would be FDA approved tomorrow and everybody would take it. Right. Instead, we don't have it. <laughs> we don't have that drug, but we can exercise. So we always recommend this to our patient, just find the exercise routine that works for you, that you like, you need to have your, you need to get your heart beating faster. That, that is key. You know, yes, mm-hmm. walking is lovely, but then walk faster. You, know, you have to challenge your cardiovascular system so that the brain can experience an increase in blood flow, more oxygen, more nutrients, more resilience, because the brain contains a huge amount of veins. Basically, you know, the, the vasculature of the brain is incredible. You need to support it. And, and you do it by keeping your heart strong in your entire system strong. So brisk walk five times a week, three times a week. Great. If you can do something more, a clinical trials of exercise has shown that some parts of your brain can actually regrow. Oh my God. Yeah. Like the memory center of the brain, the hippocampus actually did not show any decline Mm -hmm. in people who were walking fast. Those were elderly people who were just walking fast very often, like throughout the week. And actually, in some cases, show show the bit of a, a rebound. I mean, that's so beautiful, like valuable information. So, a, I'm always looking at how do I show up tomorrow morning, right? How do I show up today in the best way that I possibly can? Um, if I have to look at my hormones, and amazing. If I have to look at like what are the things that I need to look at in order to protect my brain, so that I can show up, being able to make business decisions, being able to be um, emotionally like sober, I like to call it, so that I can have um, maybe some conflicts in the day that it doesn't spill me over emotionally. Like, how do I show up to be strong and confident? Like everything we're talking about um, is about the now, but then also what are the things that I can do? for to help my the future lisa in me that's going to get there right like the hope is that i do live long enough to be 95 years old so what are you know what are the things so exercise is fantastic diet supplements let's talk about stress stress is we all know that you know especially now these days stress isn't good for you it gets you know it's actually causing you know early heart attacks and strokes and things like that but i've actually heard you say that stress is actually harder on females than it is on males can you talk to me about that because that was fascinating yeah so uh, what happens in reality is that stress works in balance with their sex hormones so the way that the body reacts to stress is by increasing the production of a hormone called cortisol, which is the main stress hormone. And the way that the brain is, the body and the brain is able to do that is by sinking or reducing the production of your sex hormones because they, they all come from the same precursor. For your brain and your body to be able to increase the production of cortisol, that means suppressing the production of sex hormones like estradiol and progesterone. Mm. When that happens, as a woman, you don't feel great because your brain is literally wired to be activated in part by the estrogen, especially the estrogen, but also the progesterone because estrogen is an activator for the brain. It's a neuroprotective hormone that has a very boosting effect on brain energy levels. So when your cortisol goes up, your estradiol goes down and your brain suffers. And then 
new studies with brain scans that, that use brain scans to look at this relationship has shown that chronic stress, so not just acute occasional mm. stress, but chronic stress increases cortisol levels in a way this is quite persistent. And that really has deleterious effect on memory performance already in midlife, so starting at age 35, especially in women. And that gets worse after women go through menopause because then the high cortisol actually correlates with brain shrinkage only in women. Wow. Yes, that is bad news. That is very bad news because I don't know any woman who's not under stress, most Mm -hmm. likely chronic stress. Like you turn 35 and you're stressed out and that is unlikely to get better (laughs) unless you really put an effort and come up with strategies to reduce stress. So reducing stress doesn't just save your day. It also really saves your brain for the long term. So I think it's really important for all of us to just take a collective (gasps) sigh, you know, and just acknowledge the fact that we're all under stress and that we need to, we really need to prioritize reducing stress is a very important brain protective strategy. And we, I think we're all aware that well-being is a skill, right? We, we know that cultivating well-being is really a skill and is, a, is mm-hmm. very much an urgent public health need, but we're not given the tools to do that. Yeah. We, we have a million different tools to take care of our hair, to take care of our skin. <laughs> so right? For our bodies to look a certain way, you go to the gym, there are all, there's all sorts of contraptions available. But very little has been done for people to really have the tools to cultivate mental health and well being. And we live in a, in a society that consistently prioritizes productivity and just soldering on and, and, and just toughening up instead of de-stressing and taking time for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think especially as women, we need to do that because a woman has no time for herself. And men could say, well, we don't have either. Yeah, but but women have less, right? And it just starts as soon as you leave school and you find a job that you're literally sandwiched between responsibilities and Mm -hmm. there's so many expectations saying, you have to work so hard just to keep your role in society and just to keep your job. You have to fight for equal rights and equal pay and you're under stress. So we need to find solutions against stress. I, I really strongly yeah. believe that. I'm not good at it, by the way. <laughs> so that's the thing. Okay, so let's say everything you're saying, right? I completely agree with. You agree with too, but we both know we're not great at it. So what are the things, because everyone listening, I'm sure is thinking the same, right? It's like, oh my God, I get it. Yes, it's really detrimental. Way worse than I think we ever thought it was. Um, and so now it's like, but how do we actually monitor that and live a life right where we live a life where we can get on with our lives that we're not you know like for instance running a business and doing a show like women of impact it's freaking stressful but i love it right but it's 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 filling my heart it's my mission it's my purpose so i go i'm not going to stop it but i recognize that stress is very detrimental to my health and how i show up and how i'm going to be at 90 years old so what are the things that we can do just to keep an eye on that doesn't become an entire life change because I wish it could be everyone could do life changes we all magically change the way that we live and we're all good and now we're managing our stress we all know that's not a reality so what are the things in reality knowing all the things you have to go through knowing all the things I have to go through that we can do maybe on a day-to-day basis that can help alleviate that so that we don't blink and in five, 10 years, we're a big ball of stress and we can't unwind it. Yeah, and we have no brains left. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think the best answers are exercise, sleep, meditation. These are really the most effective things that one can do. Diet is also effective, I think, but exercise is a must. Exercise boosts your endorphins, reduces inflammation, and blunts your response to stress. It makes you better at responding to stress. So exercise is a big deal. I think actually in that case, yoga or that kind of mind-body techniques Mm. would also be really helpful if it's your thing. 
for me, it really helps. I, I, I have a hard time sitting still and I had to sit a lot. So when, I, when I'm able to move, I'd rather do something fast, like running or I actually invested in a small elliptical machine that can keep literally next door. So whenever I'm in a meeting that I don't have to have video on for, I'll just be <laughs> on the elliptical or going for walks if you can. Being in nature, actually, being in nature has been shown to have wonderful effects on, on mm. stress levels. My daughter is very outdoorsy. Mm. And so weekends, we try to go for walks and we have a little forest nearby that she yeah. likes to go. That is very nice. And another thing is really meditation. And I, I do encourage meditation for kids as mm. well. Like my daughter meditates with me at night. We have these little meditations for children as an app that I really like. That she loves and little stories. But that really has changed my life. So as you know, I would just recommend Jack Cornfield. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. it. Yeah. It's fantastic. And meditations for beginners, they're guided meditations. And just his voice is just so soothing and so real. Like he really walks his talk mm-hmm. that I really enjoy that. And then he wrote books and, you know, there are other people who, who do this kind of work and it's very, very helpful. And meditation is like exercise. You need to find the kind of meditation that really works for you. Yeah. So for me, it's insight meditation, mindfulness meditation, but there are so many other options. And there are people who like to do that with apps. I personally don't, except for my child. But there are a ton of apps that can really help. It's the same as sleep. You know, sleep kind of got the bad rap in the sense of like, oh, well, that's the thing you can skip. That's the thing you don't have to focus on. Um, talk to me about actually the, the impact of sleep on our brains. Mm-hmm. And sleep is really like one of the last frontiers in a way, because we, we now mm-hmm. understand the importance of sleep for brain health. There are many different things that happen during sleep. One that is very important is that the brain is able to reduce inflammation when we're sleeping. And the other one is that it's really, it's literally the only chance that the brain has to take care of itself. So sleep is me time for the brain. (laughs) And sleep goes in cycles, right? There are different phases of sleep that start with you know, when you're just falling asleep, there's sleepiness, you start having dreams, but then you go through a phase where you have no dreams, so your body's completely still. And that is the slow wave sleep phase or the deep sleep phase that is followed by REM sleep when we have dreams. But that phase when we're completely still and the brain is not dreaming is actually the crucial component of sleep in terms of health and well-being, because that is really when the brain activates. It's like the brain is your mom and says, okay, the kids are are down for the night. I can take a shower. I just can take care of myself. And literally the brain is like, oh, everybody's quiet. The house is quiet. I'm going to turn on this new system, the glymphatic system, that is like a dishwasher. It just literally jets of water or fluid that open up in the brain and remove, it's like power wash your brain so that all the toxins, all the impurities, all the waste products, even Alzheimer's plaques are removed then. Because when we're awake and we're moving, we're doing stuff, there are these these, um, microglial cells in the brain that just pick up all these bits and pieces that need to be getting rid of. And if you're not getting that phase of your sleep, then you're going to miss out on a huge opportunity for the brain to really heal itself. That's amazing. Have you noticed then a correlation between um, a cognitive decline and people getting less and less rest? Yes. Yes, actually, there's a, there's a there's strong evidence that sleep deprivation or even just fragmented sleep when you keep waking up multiple times mm-hmm. at night is associated with the development of Alzheimer's disease in the brain already in, in the 50s. And it's not just Alzheimer's disease, there's also inflammation. There's, there's mm. Basically, I think that when it comes to lifestyle, I think what we're understanding is that if you don't have a healthy lifestyle, you're enabling all your risks to become actual medical issues in a way, whereas if you have a strong, healthy lifestyle, you're effectively reducing this, this risk and keeping the risks under control 
almost on a daily basis. So it's a preventative in that respect that you're really avoiding issues and you're keeping your genes at bay in a way. I love that. Okay, I'm going to ask you a really hard question right now. It may be easy for you though, I don't know. Um, so I live my health issues but I have lived a very healthy lifestyle um with the health issues I've definitely changed my life I've changed the way that I eat I changed my lifestyle like everything the way I sleep everything but I've chosen to not have children and I've heard you say in your book where you break down so we, you know going back to the subject we were saying earlier about how pregnancy like these the three p's right the the puberty and the pregnancy and at the pregnancy um whether you've had a baby or whether you've gone through those hormonal changes or not actually has an effect on your future brain and alzheimer's and things like that so i literally as i was reading your book i was like i really wanted to know the answer and you can be very honest with me but was is not having children a possible um detriment to my brain health as I age? No. Our research and other people's research have shown that women who have children have a little bit more protection against Alzheimer's disease as compared to women who don't have children and women have, who have more than five. But it's not universal. What I, what I want to clarify, sure. that this is observational. This is just of a correlation. You know, it's not that you need to have a kid tomorrow. No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, is, there are challenges, you know, I haven't, I totally get it that you'd rather not. But what is happening then in your brain that, that, that makes a difference? I think it increases plasticity. Having children, so what the research shows is that as women go through pregnancy and especially postpartum, that's really when your brain changes the most in your entire life in the fastest mm -hmm. and it changes in ways that are very complicated and we're just starting to really understand but just so far what we know is that your brain shrinks when you're pregnant and perhaps shrinks even more right after the baby is born but in a way that is very similar to puberty so it's considered an optimization in that I like to talk about pregnancy as, as, a, as a system upgrade, as if the brain is a computer and you had an upgrade during puberty, mm -hmm. and now you're having another upgrade during pregnancy because once your baby is born, that's it. You know, if you were the most important person in the room, you can forget about it. Now, <laughs> everything, you basically your job as Mother Nature intended it, is to make sure that human being survives. Right. And that means that a lot of connections in your brain are going to have to be rewired to stimulate your maternal instincts and stimulate your ability to really respond mm. to the requests of a creature who can't speak or can't move for a long time. <laughs> and so what people say is that what scientists have shown is that you basically do lose connections in some parts of the brain you lose neurons, but your connectivity gets stronger in certain parts of the brain that are preparing you for motherhood. So your brain is going through a rewiring and a remodeling mm -hmm. that seems to be helpful in that plasticity is stimulated. So your brain becomes much more plastic and that seems to give an advantage for the long term as well. Now, if you don't get pregnant, your brain is fine. You know, actually <laughs> you're avoiding this, this turmoil that needs to happen. So I think this is just one factor that is so specifically unique to women. Obviously, men can't have children. Mm -hmm. right? So this is a mechanism, it's a biological mechanism that has evolved to support motherhood. And the vast majority of people see that as being adaptive, even though you have the mommy brain, even though you have brain fog, even though like <laughs> I found myself literally knocking on the door of the fridge before opening the fridge. <laughs> I'm very polite, you know, I would have just open the door. So it's just knocking and waiting and waiting. And then my husband's like, hmm. <laughs> so that's the thing though, I, but that's what I process, right? Is that 
I'm not going to have a child just so that I can create brain plasticity, but I do look, I do look at this stuff. And I actually, I don't think that that's a bad thing. Like if you were like, yes, Lisa, you know, they do have the edge, which you said, right? They do have the edge. So then I go to now, how do I create brain plasticity myself without having a child? Because I just go to, if they're facts, there are facts. And now just being aware of it allows me to think outside the box. So for instance, with someone like, is there something that I can do, like a test or anything that I could do to help me gain um, brain plasticity without actually having to have a child? <laughs> Having having kids is just one factor. There, there's a million factors. Women who develop or go through puberty earlier on in life and go through menopause later in life, so those with the longest reproductive span, they also have an edge, right? They, mm. Their brains also have more plasticity because you've had more of these hormones in your body for a longer period of time. So that's that's another factor. Yeah. Or whether or not you took hormones throughout your life, whether or not you took like birth control, or whether or not you're going to have to take estradiol for symptoms of menopause. Those also are factors then that are just as important. Uh, your diet is important. Your fitness is important. How much sleep you get per night is important. Your happiness is important. Your positive outlook on life is important. You don't have to have children to protect your brain. It's just one component to brain health. And the reason we were looking into it is it's because we're interested in hormones and how hormones impact the brain. Yeah, like I said, I wouldn't have a baby for that reason. But it's I just I, I'm, I'm such a person that like I want to have the knowledge no matter what that means. So when I heard your you say about um, the benefits of brain plastic, plasticity when you have kids, the first thing that came to mind was, oh, am I am I now? a step behind and I don't mind if I am it's kind of like I just want to know the truth so that I can then plan for like all right what else can I do um to mitigate this so all right I I don't think you you should worry at all these studies are descriptive and I, I think they're, mm-hmm. they're important because hopefully they will stimulate more research right right Probably because there's very little research done on pregnancy and the long-term effects of pregnancy on the brain all we know is what happens basically when you're pregnant and like within two oh, years. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Baby, there's very little work done to associate that with anything else later in life. So I think it's just the process of a better understanding our brains and how to keep them healthy. And I, I think lifestyle is incredibly important. Mm. We see that at the clinic all the time that when people really comply <laughs> with the guidelines and recommendations that they're given, their memory improves, their attention improves, their overall health really improves. And for some women, taking hormones may be helpful. Mm -hmm. So there are many different strategies. And I think that the approach should be individualized. Well, I feel like we've definitely touched a lot of subjects in this episode. You've given so many nuggets of gold. Where can people find you and the book and everything that you're doing? Because I believe you're writing a new book. So where can people follow you to find out more? I think Instagram, Dr. Dr. Underscore, which I don't particularly really like, but Moscone, M-O-S-C-O-N-I. And that's the best way. Or my website, which is easier, is lisamoscone.com. Oh, Lisa, thank you so much. Guys, guys, you've got to check out her book. I am freaking obsessed. I'm obsessed with the brain and I'm obsessed with very specifically the XX female brain because I want to understand myself and I want to understand why I show up and do the things that I do as well as protect myself for the future because you trust me, trust me guys, I want to live till I'm at least 100 and I can only do that if I have absolute brain clarity. So go check her out, check out her book. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Bilyeu. If you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button and until next time guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. I, I think this is so important because there's a lot of messages out there. Let's be happy. Mm-hmm. Let me show you how to just be happy all the time. And I say that is just not realistic. I say we are human. We have this whole array.